Hello, my name is David Cahoon, and this talk is going to be a simple introduction to matrix algebra. It was devised originally for the course which we ran from 2003 to 2013 to teach uh, the principles of analysis of single channel recordings. The challenge was to see whether we could teach people about matrices who'd never come across them before. The thing about matrix algebra is that it's easier than learning calculus, say, because there's no new ideas involved, just a new notation. And the things you can do with it are just wonderful. Here goes. I hope that in an hour or so, you have got the basic ideas of matrix algebra sufficient to cope with subjects like single ion channel recording or almost sufficient. To paraphrase the great textbook calculus made easy, by Salvanius P. Thompson in 1910. The lecture can be regarded as being a very simplest introduction to those beautiful methods of reckoning, which are generally known by the terrifying names of matrices and eigenvalues. Okay, let's go. First of all, a matrix is just a table of numbers and you just you denote by a single letter the whole table of numbers for example a can be this table a matrix is generally written in boldface italic to distinguish it from an ordinary number there's nothing no new principles involved in matrix algebra just ordinary arithmetic and algebra um, it's not like calculus is much easier than that. It's just a sort of notation, but a very convenient one. So this is a three by three matrix. It can be any sort of shape. This is a two by four matrix, two rows and four columns. And the entries in the table are called the elements of the matrix and they're denoted by symbols a subscript ij is the entry in the ith row and the jth column for example a23 is in the second row and the third column so far so simple and two matrices are deemed to be equal if all the corresponding elements are equal. The, there's various things you can do with a matrix when you've got it. The transpose of a matrix is found by interchanging its rows and columns. A is a a two by four matrix and its transpose indicated by this superscript T, it's not a power, it's just a, a label, is a four by two matrix. The first row of this becomes the first column of that, second row of this becomes the second column of that. In general, AIJ becomes in the transpose B, J, I. For example, A, 2, 4. Which is minus 2 in A becomes B, 4, 2 in the transpose. There's another useful rule if you want to manipulate these things, that if you transpose the product of two matrices, their order gets reversed like this. But what you mean by the product of two matrices will come too soon. The 
term vector in this particular context means a matrix that has only one column or row. C here is a column vector or a three by one matrix, three rows, one column. R is a, a row vector or a one by three matrix, one row and three columns. In this particular case, C is the transpose of R. And now two special matrices. A diagonal matrix is a square matrix that has all its elements zero except those on the diagonal. That has special simple properties. An even simpler diagonal matrix is a diagonal matrix with the diagonal elements all one. And that's denoted by the letter I, bold italic I. And this unit matrix functions like the number one because multiplying it by, had, by it has no effect. I times B equals B times I, which is just B. Just try it out yourself if you doubt that. Now we have to define the basic operations. We've defined equality. How do you add two matrices? Well, that's easy. You just add the corresponding elements. If you want A plus B, you add three and two, one and three, and so on. Minus four plus minus two, and you get the elements, corresponding element of the sum of them. In symbols, you put it like that. Notice that you can only add two matrices if they have the same shape, the same number of rules, rules, rows and columns. And the following rules of ordinary algebra, oops, are true for matrices too. A plus B is the same as B plus A and the brackets work the same as well. So that's all very straightforward. Two more operations that are performed separately on each element of a matrix. If you want to multiply a matrix by a constant number, an ordinary scalar number, scalar means not matrix, <laughs> then you just multiply each of the elements of A by that constant, it couldn't be simpler. Also differentiation of a matrix, it's not obvious what that means, but it just means you differentiate each element separately, A11 one, one by DX, DA12 by DX and so on. So again, that's very straightforward. Multiplication of two matrices seems a little obscure and arbitrary at first sight, but it turns out that the way the product of two matrices is defined turns out to be key to how useful they are. Let's multiply two matrices A and B and we get C. How do we do that? Well, Multiplication is said to be a, a row into column operation. You will see why shortly. How do we get the first element of the product? We take the first row of A and the first column of B and we proceed as follows. First row of A, first column of B, and we multiply together these two numbers two times five, and we add to that the sum of the second two numbers, one times three, and that gives us the product, which is 13, and 13 is what goes into C11. Likewise, 
for the second row and first column, we get with what we need to get C21, second row, first column. So second row of A is there. The first column of C is there. Three times five is, and then add four times three and we get 27 and that's C21. To get C12, we want the first row of A and the second column of B. That's two times four plus one times two, which is 10, and that's C12. And for the second, for the for C22, we want the second row of A, second column of B, three times four plus four times two, which is 20, which is C22. So that's the rule for multiplying matrices. And it's, it seems a little obscure, as I said, but it, it makes perfect sense, as we'll see soon. Notice that this definition of row into column multiple multiplication means that A and B can be multiplied only if the number of columns in A is the same as the number of rows in B. If you're in doubt, always write the size of the matrices below the expression. Here's an example which involves multiplication of a, a two by four matrix by a four by two matrix, and the result is a two by two matrix example, the first row and the second column uh, can be multiplied, as we said before, to give this, which is the element, one, two element in the result. So we write down below each of them, it's very useful for keeping track of what's going on, the size of each matrix, that's two by three, this is three by two. So in order to be able to multiply them at all, those two numbers must be the same. And the outer pair of numbers is the size of the result, two by two. Another little complication when it comes to multiplication is that unlike in ordinary algebra, the order in which you do things matters. If you define two matrices, A and B, multiplying them shows that A times B is that, but B times A is different. In general, it's different. In particular circumstances, they may be the same, but in general, they're different. So in this case, we say A pre-multiplies B, and in that case, we say A post-multiplies B. You have to distinguish between those two things. So although the usual rules apply for multiplying out brackets, so for example, A open brackets, B plus C close brackets is that, that's not the same as if the A came after the bracket because that reverses the order of the multiplication. So back to some special matrix products, a unit matrix I works like the number one because multiplying by it has no effect. And in fact, in this case, uh, the order doesn't matter. I times B is the same as B times I. They're both equal to B. Just do an example if you want to convince yourself. Another very useful thing to notice is that if you have a unit vector, often called little u, we use bold lowercase characters often for vectors, and all the units in it are one, then post-multiplying by it adds things up. 
if we want r times u, we get 3 times 1 plus 0 times 1 minus 1 times 1. So the product would be 2, or in general, a row vector times a unit vector will be just the sum of the elements. Well, technically, the result is a, a one by one matrix, but the distinction doesn't matter in practice. And that's uh, a useful thing because any product that starts with a row vector and ends with a column vector turns out to be an ordinary scalar number, one by one matrix. If A is N by M, B is M by K, then we can see from the rules we've given already that the if it, the first thing is a row vector one by n, the last thing is a, a column vector k by one, then the final result will be an ordinary number. That's a, a useful thing to bear in mind. The reason why matrices are multiplied as they are is essential essentially to do with the, the way they used to represent simultaneous equations consider this pair of simultaneous equations two unknowns a1 and a2 and the coefficients are like that Now you can see if we now define a column vectors for the A's and the X's, A1, A2, X1, X2, and we define a square matrix B that contains the coefficients, we can see that the whole set of equations can be represented as A equals BX, multiplying out the right-hand side is a two by one vector on each side and they look like this that's a two by one vector this is a two by one vector and because they're <coughs> equal the separate elements are equal a1 equals b1 and so on that's the first equation a2 is that the, but the advantage of this notation that A equals BX represents any sort of equation, so any number of them with any number of unknowns. That's the beauty of the generalization. We'll also see in, in the context of single channels that matrix multiplication combines probabilities in a very convenient way. So we've done addition we've done multiplication now about division of matrices how is that done how do we divide two tables well we don't talk about division we talk about inversion in ordinary algebra the solution of a equals bx for x is just x equals a over b we divide both sides by b at least that's the result as long as b is not zero. We can also write that result as x equals b to the minus one because b to the minus one just means one over b. If you have a matrix equation, a equals bx, then the solution is written as x equals b to the minus 1a, just like this, where b to the minus 1 is a matrix which we call the inverse of b. We never write it as 1 over b, but we write it as b to the minus 1, and that's a matrix which is called the inverse of b. So how is it defined? In ordinary algebra, you can think of division as being defined by x over x equals one. Likewise with matrices, 
using an identity matrix in place of one, the inverse of B is defined such that if you multiply it by B, you get the unit matrix. So in the process of solving A equals B X, we pre-multiply both sides by B to the minus one. And we get B to the minus one A equals B to the minus one B X. Now that's just the identity matrix. So it's just equal to X as the solution. Now, in ordinary algebra, we can't divide by B if it's zero. With matrices, we say that we can't find the inverse of a matrix if the matrix is singular. And what we mean by this, we'll discover if we discover how to, to find uh, the inverse of a matrix. Now, at this point, I should notice that you never have to do these things by hand in real life. Well, you can in simple cases, but in complicated cases, no one would ever find the inverse of a seven by seven matrix by hand. It would be very lengthy. It's impossible, but it would be very lengthy. And it's always done by a computer program. Every computer language has subroutines which will find the inverse of a matrix for you of any size. Nevertheless, we'll just go through the process by hand for a simple case of a two by two matrix. We can show that an inverse matrix can exist. Say we have A is that, and B is that. Then multiplying those two together, you soon find gives you the identity matrix. So B is the inverse of A. Another useful rule is that if you invert the product of two matrices, then the order gets reversed, just like when you transpose them. So there's several useful things you can find from any square matrix. Um, these things are all defined from the matrix. They, there's no new principles involved. For any square matrix, you can find the following quantities. You can find its determinant. It's a single number, but it turns out it's needed for inversion of matrices, among other things. You can find its rank, which is also a single number. That's helpful for understanding things like correlations between open and shut times in a single ion channel, and the connections between states in a reaction scheme. You can find its characteristic polynomial, a polynomial equation, that's a, a line, a quadratic equation, a cubic equation. And the roots of this polynomial are the eigenvalues of the matrix. You don't, again, again, you never have to find eigenvalues by hand. People have spent decades optimizing routines for getting the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a matrix and the program does it for you. The eigenvalues of a matrix is a, a set of K numbers, which are the, res which are the roots of this poly characteristic polynomial. In other words, the values for which it's zero. And the eigenvalues in the case of a single ion channel analysis, the eigenvalues of Q are the reciprocals of the time constants that you expect in a macroscopic relaxation. So they're, they're sort of generalization of, of time constants for the matrix case. 
You can also find for any square matrix the eigenvectors. This is a set of k vectors, each of which is k by one, a column vector. And there's one eigenvector for each eigenvalue. They're useful for finding the relative areas of exponential components, for example. And last but not least, you can find magical things called the spectral expansion matrices. This is a set of K matrices, each the same size as the original one. They can be found directly from the eigenvalues and they allow simple calculation of almost anything. They're wonderful. So let's just look Again, you don't have to do this ever in real life, but just look at the question of inversion of a matrix and its relationship to determinants. When I first got as an undergraduate, I picked up a book called Determinants and Matrices by Aitken, and I was very baffled at first. I, I remember asking a PhD student who was in the same hall of residence as I was in Leeds, what the difference was between a determinant and a matrix. He, he was a PhD in physical chemistry, so he knew about these things. And he says a matrix is a table and a determinant is, determinant is a number that can be calculated from the matrix. So that cleared that up and I never looked back. For example, the determinant of a matrix A, which you denote by debt A or A with vertical lines on each side of it is defined as the product of the diagonal elements minus the product of the off diagonal elements. And that's what you need to calculate the inverse of a matrix. The inverse of a two by two matrix can be calculated like this as A22 divided by determinant of A. So the determinant of A occurs in every term, it's a constant, it can come outside and we get this for the for the inverse. And that immediately shows you that if this number, the determinant of A is zero, then you can't invert a matrix. A matrix with a zero determined is called a singular matrix <coughs> and it can't be inverted. So there are analogous definitions of determinant and inverse for matrices of any side, but we shan't in general ever need to calculate them. In practice, they're always calculated by a program. Okay, another thing that's associated with the matrix is the characteristic polynomial and its eigenvalues. Again, we don't have to worry about how to calculate these in general. In fact, the characteristic polynomial we probably never calculate. The eigenvalues we certainly do. The polynomial is of degree K, that means the powers, highest power in it is, is the unknown to the power K. In a quadratic, for example, it would be 2A plus BX plus CX squared, for example. So we'll do a little bit of algebra here, though you never have to do this in real life. For any square matrix Q, we can write down this equation. Q minus lambda I times a vector, which is zero. 
where the lambda i are the eigenvalues and the these are the eigenvectors, one for each eigenvalue. Now, any square matrix, when multiplied by a non-zero vector, can give a, a zero result only if it's singular. In other words, its determinant is zero. So we know that the determinant of this polynomial is zero. That equation is a polynomial of degree k, and so it has k solutions for the lambdas. And we can demystify all of this by a simple example. A quadratic polynomial, as I said, it has the form of ax squared plus bx plus c. It has two roots, which is, that means when that's equal to zero, the, the roots are the value of x for which the whole thing is zero. So if we plot it out, the value of x is there, it's zero, and here it's zero. It's crossing the zero line at these two points. Likewise, for a cubic polynomial, there will generally be three roots. Oh, dear. It looks like this and it'll cross the zero line three times and that'll be the position of the three values of x for which that is zero. So let's look at the characteristic polynomial eigenvalues and eigenvectors, a simple example. Take a the two by two matrix Q and another two by two matrix, which is diagonal with lambda on the diagonals. So Q minus lambda I is just that. And the characteristic polynomial is the determinant of that, which comes out to be that times that minus that times that. And if we multiply out the brackets on the right hand side, we get a simple quadratic equation that has two solutions for lambda and those are the two eigenvalues of Q. Eigenvalues demystified. As a numerical example, we can take that. So the determinant of Q is eight, two times four minus naught times one. The characteristic polynomial is comes out to be this and the solution of this quadratic gives the eigenvalues as two and four that they're the points at which this curve crosses the zero line And we can find the eigenvectors for those that correspond to those eigenvalues by solving this. The solution of that is not straightforward because we can't just invert this thing in, in brackets, it's singular, uh, but the, there are ways of solving it. They're the same as the ways you use to solve, to get the equilibrium occupancies in a reaction mechanism. And it comes out that the first eigenvector is for the uh, eigenvalue being two is that. And for the second eigenvalue, the eigenvector is this. 
Um, in, in fact, eigenvectors can be multiplied by any constant. So we could equally write the first eigenvector as two and one, because that's point. Uh, that is twice that. So inspection of that example suggests two rules that are quite general. The sum of all the eigenvalues of a matrix is equal to the sum of the diagonal elements of a matrix. That sum of the diagonal elements is known as the trace. So if, for example, one diagonal element is much bigger than all the others, because, for example, there's a very short-lived shut state, remember the time constants or the mean lifetimes are the reciprocals of the minus eigenvalues. Then the sum of all the eigenvalues will be very similar to the fastest one. And that, that state will predominate. Furthermore, the product of all the eigenvalues is of a, a, a matrix is equal to the determinant of that matrix. Again, that's something which you don't need to do to do ever because all you have to do is use a, um, a routine that finds the determinant or the rank or the inverse of a matrix you put in Q and out comes the inverse in numbers. So that was a bit recondite but not strictly necessary to, to understand. There is, however, one trick that you really do need to understand, which is incredibly beautiful. And it arises when you ask, what do we mean by the function, by a function of a matrix? Whereas that function is the cube of the matrix, it's very obvious because that's just A times A times A. We know how to multiply matrices so we can easily calculate that. But what does it mean? to have a matrix as a power. We know what E squared is, but E to the power of a matrix, what on earth is that? Well, it turns out that it's quite simple to define because remember that the exponential E in the ordinary arithmetic case is defined by this infinite series e to the x is 1 plus x plus x squared over factorial 2 plus x cubed over factorial 3 and so on. For example for x equals 1 this is 1 plus 1 plus 0.5 plus a sixth and if you were gone forever you get the value of e 2.718. Now, for the matrix of an exponential, you can define it in exactly the same way, except that the ones are replaced by the identity matrix. So E to the QAAT is one I plus QAAT plus QAAT all squared over factorial two and so on. Now to, to, to work out this, right hand side, all you have to do is be able to multiply the matrices and add them. So the mystery disappears. And that definition also makes it obvious that E to the Q T is a matrix which is the same size as Q. This infinite series could in principle, be used to evaluate e to the q numerically, but in fact, it's the worst of the 17 or so different ways we've known 
which are known for for evaluating each of the QAA. So instead of using that to, to, to solve it numerically, we use a thing called spectral expansion. And this is the last thing you can get from a matrix and one of the most beautiful. So if Q is a K by K matrix, K by K matrix with K eigenvalues, we can calculate K matrices, which have quite remarkable properties. These A matrices, spectral expansion matrices, sum to the unit matrix, and more surprisingly, when you raise them to a power, they're not changed. If you multiply two different A matrices together, you get a zero matrix. If you raise an A matrix to a power, it's not changed. And the main matrices add up to one. That seems a bit miraculous, but it's very easy to find. But the really important results for A matrices comes from Sylvester's theorem, Sylvester, one of the pioneers of matrix algebra. So that's Sylvester's theorem. And what it says is that the A matrices can be used to define any function of a matrix. And all we need to do is calculate that function of the eigenvalues of Q. These eigenvalues are ordinary scalar numbers. So all the mystery of what is meant by a function of a matrix vanishes. For any function Q, that's equal to the, that same function of the eigenvalues, ordinary numbers, <coughs> each multiplied by the spectral expansion matrices and added up over the K eigenvalues. So examples of the spectral expansion of Q, well, the simplest one is where the function is just Q itself. So that should equal the eigenvalues times the spectral expansion matrices added up over K and checking that this right hand sum comes to Q is a good way to check that you've got the spectral expansion matrices right. Similarly, if you want to raise power Q to the power R, if R is an integer, you just multiply it by itself R times, uh, but you can do it without any <laughs> Uh, matrix multiplication at all via Sylvester's theorem, because all you have to do is raise the eigenvalue to the power R multiplied by the spectral expansion matrix corresponding one and add them up and you get Q to the R without any need to calculate powers of Q at all, not only to multiply matrices at all. This relationship for example, in the single channel context allows the distribution of the number of openings per burst to be expressed as a mixture of geometric components. But most important, we are interested in E to the QT. So we can find that from Sylvester's theorem as E to the lambda T. That's a purely scalar quantity for each eigenvalue lambda is multiplied by the <coughs> corresponding spectral expansion matrix and added up and that gives you e to the qt. That's, that's how you calculate it in practice. And it's what allows, for example, prob probability density functions to be expressed as a mixture of scalar exponential components. That's what these are. For example, if Q is a two by two matrix and its two eigenvalues are lambda one and lambda two, 
then e to the qt is e to the lambda 1t times the first spectral expansion matrix plus e to the lambda 2t plus the second matrix. How you calculate the spectral expansion matrices? Well, again, it's something you, you never do in practice, but I'll just run through it anyway. Given any k by k matrix, the k eigenvalues are those, and the palette, the characteristic polynomial is given by determinant of this is zero. So an example that was worked out in MathCAD, it looks like this in MathCAD, there's Q minus lambda I, and that comes out to be lambda squared, this quadratic equation. So we can then define the column eigenvectors. They, they, unless otherwise specified, they're usually columns defined in, in this way. You can also define row eigenvectors that are defined in this way. And all programs, every programming language has simple methods that have been optimized over many decades for finding them for you. In fact, you only need the column eigenvectors because you can easily find the row eigenvectors through this relationship. And you can now calculate the spectral expansion matrices, the wonderful A matrices, by the mth matrix is the mth column vector times the mth row vector. Notice that they're, they're k by k, because the column vectors are k by one, the row vectors are one by k. So that's it. I hope you've got the idea. But please remember that m most of the numerical calculation will be done for you. You never have to find eigenvalues and eigenvectors by hand, but it's handy to know how to manipulate them when doing, when going through equations. Okay, thank you.